um, cool, nice softwares that will help you size generator for a commercial building. So for the time being, I want you guys to remember, this chapter is only for dwelling. It talks about generators for dwelling, which is very similar to any other installation. Except when we size a generator for a building, we size it based on um, softwares. Almost all the manufacturers, CAT, Cummins, Color, any major manufacturer of generator guys, they have a little software that they give it to you. Three, when you plot, you plug your number and then you come up with the KW size of your generator based on the starting load capability as well as the running load. Okay. So standby power system. Standby power system, guys, in the NEC code book is divided into three, if you don't know that by now. There is three articles, and I don't want to dig deeper into them because you guys are going to go into them. So a standby system divided into article 700. This is your emergency system. And article, where is my, this is article, this is number one. Number two, for standby system, uh, 701 in any secret book. This is legally required required system. And number three is optional. This one, 702. 702, 702 optional. Optional system. Okay, so most of the building guys are required by code to have, we, you're required to have a service, right? We talked about service entrance conductor to a building, feeding it with a service. Now, some buildings are required by code to have another source of energy in it, another source of energy for emergency system. <laughs> I'm not going to talk in detail about these three chapters because it's coming in the commercial. That's where we hash them, really. The only thing I want you to understand right now, hospitals, um, 700, Article 700, apply to hospitals and you're required to have a generator. If you lose power and Chad Curtis' chest is open and they're working on his heart, would you hope for Pete's sake that the power will come back? If the power, if you lost the transmission line, there's a generator sitting there to pick up the power. Would you hope that? So that's where the emergency system is. If you guys want to remember, your emergency system has to come up within 10 seconds. That's really what, what distinguishes them and call them emergency system. A good example of this, emergency lights, if you lose power right here at Dunwoody, we should have an emergency light in the hallways that walk us safely outside the building. Hospitals, receptacles, and air conditioning systems and lights in operation room have to be up and running so they continue working on somebody's heart. So that's required by the basically the law as an emergency. For this, we use a lot of the time we use generators. That's why we talk about this one, generators. Then, legally required standby system. You have a sump pump here at Dunwoody. And if it floods, if it doesn't work, it floods the whole area and it becomes almost health hazard. Then the, the government will require you, the local government will require you to pick up this sump pump because it becomes a health hazard with all this stuff flooding all over. Jails, you have certain jails, locks and certain things in the jails. You have, you know, you lose power, you have to have a backup generators. Um, a police station, certain areas in the police station, you need a backup not because it's emergency, because it's legally required. You lose power, you can't service the public. So there's certain areas you have to bring in because of legally required by the government, be it state, local, or, or federal. These guys have to come within 10 sec uh, within 60 seconds, 60 seconds. Everybody knows what, when I say come up within 10 seconds, come up within 10 seconds, if, an if this is an emergency light and I lose power right here, it should come up within 10 seconds. So count 10 Mississippis, this should come up. Or before, of course, no, no more than 10 seconds. The, the, everything, the generator have to start, pick up, the transfer switch have to transfer you within 10 seconds. Can I have thumbs up, Chad? We fully understand that? Cool. Optional standby system. Now, Chad is lazy. He want to have a generator right in the back of his yard, in, the, in his backyard. So if you lose power, um, he goes there after he finishes cup of coffee and talk to Mrs. Curdy. He can go and push the button and start. How long? Is there any limitation? How long? Um, any seconds? Whenever. I always say whenever. Whenever. So, for example, Dunwoody wants to have a generator right here to pick up the building. If we lose power, that's called a standby system. Not required. Standby. Any questions guys, about these three systems that we have that we need generators for most of the time? Can I have thumbs up, Chad? We understand them. By the way, we're coming back to them for the commercial, so I'm not going to dig deeper into them. Okay, so today we're going to talk about standby power system. 
Here you can see that there are three types of standby power system, three times, the emergency, they get required, and the standby that basically people want to put it just because. Okay, so that's what, what I want you guys to do. A few things we're gonna do, uh, safety issues. The most important thing with the standby power system, guys, is, is, uh, um, is, is the safety issues. Most of the system that we do in the dwelling, in dwelling is option and standby system. So basically the last one, 702. Uh, safety, what's the safety? Two things, number one, if you put a generator and you tie it to the grid and you feed back the grid and somebody's working on the grid, what happened to that person? You could kill somebody, right? Number one. Number two, if you tie your generator to the grid when they're not in parallel, you know what's gonna to happen to your generator? The grid, it's like trying with, uh, if, you have a, if, you, if you tie your generator with the grid without paralleling them, syncing them together, imagine that. It's like you're trying to push a semi, a big semi that's going at uh, say 80 miles an hour you're going this way and you are going with your car, really little tiny little car, 30 miles an hour and trying to stop the semi. Can you do that? Against it, can you do that? So what's gonna happen when you slam right through the, the semi? Who's gonna lose? You're gonna lose. That's exactly what happened when you put the generator, tie it to the, to the grid without synchronizing it, guys, without synchronizing it. So you're gonna, it's gonna change your generator into a motor. We'll talk about this one. So that's a safety issue, blow up your generator. Uh, basic of standby system, we talked about the three systems that we have, the emergency, legal required, and standby optional system. Um, type of standby systems, we'll talk about different types of standby system, which is the, the three that we, we mentioned in, in a second here. Wiring diagram for portable and standby system. They're a really nice wiring diagram that you can use if you want to put a standby system for your, um, for your building, residential building. And with every standby system, guys, comes a transfer switch, a disconnect, and size uh, and size recommendation for this system. So every time we have, a, we have, a, I'll show you in a second here. When we have a generator, we need to be able to disconnect the generator upon an emergency. We need to wire the generator to a transfer switch. Everybody knows what a transfer switch is. Transfer switch if. It takes you here to the utility. If you lose the utility, you either have manually go flip the switch to this side, to the generator, after you start the generator, or if it's an auto, it will sense that the power is gone and it will flip you to the generator when the generator starts, right? So that's that's what we're gonna be talking about. And the NEC requirement for the standby system. So these are a few things I would like guys to talk about. Safety, um, I know, some of you guys are electrician, a lot of you are not an electrician, but you're gonna be a project manager. Every time you deal with generators, I'm dealing with a generator for the same clinic that I told you about right now, we, we wanna have a generator for a clinic and the, the, the power system for this generator, for this uh, building that we have is 24120 center tab delta. The first thing, Darren, you, when you wanna specify a generator for a building, they come to you as a designer. They're gonna to come to you and say, we need a generator for this building. First question you want to ask them, what is the power system that you have? 28120, 48277, three phase of course, 24120 single phase or 24120 three phase. So that building happened to be 24120 three phase. So now that's where you're going to size your generator based on that, that particular one. The problem with these uh, center tab ones three phase guys is uh, they don't have a neutral on phase B is the wild leg, we call it. So there's a lot of issues that you have to be encountered every time before, I'm not gonna go into deeper into it. When you get into sizing a generator, always ask first, what is the voltage system of the building that you want me to pick? That's step number one. Uh, turn off the power. This is typically for residential, we'll talk about this one. If you're doing it for this residential, when you hook up your standby system, you have to turn off the power, right? Meaning you isolate yourself from the grid and then you turn your generator on. That's not, there's no pattern in between them. Isolate completely from the grid, turn your power on for safety. Um, and if we, we all know what generators work on. Most of the generators that we do guys is diesel generator, diesel uh, power generators and natural gas power generators. We use them for emergency diesels a lot. So you can't put your diesel generator or natural gas generator right inside the building unless you ventilate it. So now we're talking residential here, residential 99%. 0.99% of the time you're going to throw the generator outside when you run it because of, of uh, um, the toxic monoxide, carbon monoxide that comes out of it. 
Um, and gasoline, storage gasoline safety. Um, we bring Jerry Boggs guys from Kohler Power. He's an expert, 30 years of experience and generators here. Next quarter, he's coming. Um, actually, in, in probably four or five weeks, he'll be here. And he will tell you lots of stories about generators. Natural gas generators, I'll be the fuel that you do them, all the, the whole input and output. We will give you a software to size a generator. We'll go through step-by-step -step calculation how to size generators. And we size the disconnect, the overcome friction device, and the feeder for the generator. So it's coming. Um, gasoline storage, you have to store, obviously, gasoline ex explosive. You can't, any explosive material, you have to store it properly, right? You don't want to blow up your, your house. So these are all things we will, t when we go to the commercial, we start talking about um, day tank, the day tank guys for the gas and so forth, but we're not going to talk about it today. Um, it, it goes without discussion. If you're troubleshooting your generator outside, you don't want to stand in the water and touching electrical equipment for safety. And I, I know you guys, I know Andrew, my friend, you guys are not electricians. You will be project managers. I hope one day you'll be in the field to troubleshoot things. So these are safety. Uh, enemy number one of electricity is what? Water, heat for conductors, but enemy number one of us, the reason why electricity becomes so dangerous for us, is water. If any, any, any time that we're standing on a wet location, grabbing on something hot, that's called the perfect shot. So be careful when you're in wet location, especially the generators are sitting outside, to touch on any energized objects. Um, when it comes to the generator, guys, there is, it comes with a manual how to start, stop the generator. Generators have an overcurrent friction device on them, over under voltage, over under frequency. Generators are special animals. Um, as you might, you might have figured that. Most of generator guys, you're gonna come up with uh, the engine here. You're gonna have your engine. You're gonna have your alternator. This is, um, this is gen. This is the generator part. And right in here is radiator. Right? This is what an, a generator, they call an engine generator set. You're going to hear about engine generator set. So when you talk about engine generator set, guys, you have to have the engine exactly like your, your car's engine, right? it's, except it's much bigger depending on the size. So that engine burns some type of a fuel, typically um, um, natural gas or, um, or diesel. And then when it burns, it, it rotates inside this alternator. And from there, you get your power. Uh, say if this is a three-phase system, you get your 208 slash 120 volt. And let's just say this was a 50 kW, 50 kW generator. Anybody knows what the radiator does for a living? Who, which one keeps cool? Engine. Keeps the engine cool. It's like your radiator in your car. So that's what you guys are going to be involved in. Do you think that following the manufacturer's instruction here is a big deal? This is not a dumb panel on the wall that has nothing on it. There's so many rotating objects. There's so many things that could go wrong. Run out of oil, uh, run out of gas, um, uh, all this stuff that batteries to start. You have to have a battery to start your generator. It's like any other engine. Cool. So that's why when, when I... When I work as an engineer, guys, when we do the generator set, we work side by side with the mechanical engineers. They actually specify the generator from the mechanical side. They go through the engine and the radiator. We take it from where? From the generator side. Because you have to exhaust here. And we have a really nice trip that we do for Cummins Power Plant in, in um, Fridley here. If you guys want to have a, a, a quick peek on it, go into my YouTube channel. The trip is right there. There's videos of... I think four generators, 1.2 meg each, running in parallel, and you can see the gravity of the situation. Now, obviously, we're talking about smaller stuff here for residential, but it's coming. It, it, a lot of stuff is coming, too. Um, okay, when you have a generator, why standby generators? Now, we're talking residential. A lot of people, guys, if you lose the power, they would like to pick up their um, furnace in the middle of the winter, for example, run the furnace, uh, freezers, critical loads. They call them critical loads. We're talking dwelling here, we're talking residential. So in a residential, in a dwelling, what is the critical load? In the middle of winter in Minnesota, what would that be? Furnace. Yeah, we have natural gas, but you can't run the natural gas, the furnace, without electricity. So you run your furnace on it. How about another critical? So now we can heat the house in the middle of winter. Freezer, refrigerator. If you ask Brian, he might say his plasma TV is a critical load. So, uh, or, uh, you know what I mean? So, but these are freezer, fridge, 
um, and uh, what we use a fridge and furnace. Some pump, if you have a sump pump and it floods your house, these are the critical loads that you have to pick up. So when you do a um, generator keep system running, uh, so what, why do we have them? It keeps system running when the power outages, right? So a couple of examples of in a dwelling, you pick your furnace, refrigerator, freezer. If you have a sump pump and your basement is going to flood, what do you do? You plug it in that sump pump from it. Um, so a couple of questions, which load is a critical? And like we said, Brian think his plasma TV is a critical. So we have to decide his three loads in dwelling that could that definitely critical. You can add to them a sump pump. Um, how large of a generator do I need? Obviously it will be great to pick up the whole house, but guess what, what the whole house is? Your house and mine on average, they have 10 kW, 10 kW generator to pick up the whole house on average. You might have a generator 10 kW. That's just a big boy. Most of the people go for 2, 3 kW and they pick up only the most important things in their house. So that's why picking up the whole house is great, but you're going to end up with a big, bulky generator um, that's uh, and, and expensive. How complex and how simple? We'll show you guys a couple of applications. It could be as simple as a portable generator with a, with a cable in it and plugged to certain loads. Or it could be as uh, as complex as a stationary generator tied to an auto transfer switch and pick up all or half of your the whole panel. So that's what you're going to be looking at here in a second. Um, there's a couple of uh, and you guys can go to Home Depot and any of these places. You can buy um, a lot of generators for two, three kW, five kW. Um, and they, they can up to 10 kWs, and they are uh, gasoline-driven generators. They are affordable, probably, I don't know, a couple of maybe five grands, two to three to four grands, depending on what way you do it, to buy the generator. For dwelling, remember, these are all for dwelling. You can tie them with an auto transfer switch or with an extension cord. A lot of people use an extension cord, guys, plug it into the generator and plug it into certain, certain loads. Um, they can give you this amount of power, and you keep uh, loading in four to eight hours, um, and then if you run out of the fuel, you, you remember, the only limitation on what the generator can give you is how much fuel you have on house. So you have to you have to go and buy more gasoline for that fuel, for your, that uh, generator. Um, almost always the set that we have is called gasoline-driven motor slash uh, generator, the engine generator. They call it engine generator set driven by uh, gasoline, some type of uh, gas. Um, diesel is also another alternative method. Natural gas is another alternative method of fuel, to fuel the generator. Any comments, guys, about what we can do for dwellings? For dwellings? Okay, here's a nice, a nice picture, what I think a nice picture of how, how the system um, could be done. If you guys look at this, now, um, if you look at this, this picture, uh, here's my panel. Here's my 100 amp, 100 amp panel, and I took. Can you guys see it? This is very typical installation. How a lot of people do it. Can you guys see that? You take a, a 40. Now from here, I'm going to feed all my other loads. All my other loads are fed from here, right? All the other loads are fed from here. Now what I did, I would, I took a, another panel. Can you guys see that? Another panel, and I fed all my critical loads from it. So these are all my critical loads coming from here. So this is my furnace, this is my freezer, this is my fridge, and this one is my sump pump, okay? And uh, maybe a couple of lights, um, or with them also, say with the sump pump or with the freeze, with the fridge here, I can take a couple of lights on the same circuit. Remember, there will be other couple of lights. If you have three levels, it's a good idea to have a light in every level in the hallways at least, one light in, in every hallway, in every level, and put them on a circuit and pick them up. Okay, how does this work? So look at this. Now, um, you have a portable, the cheapest way of doing it is what you're looking at, portable generator. You lose power. What happens if you lose power? Anybody knows what happens if you lose power? If you lose power, now, the, now everything is dead. So you have to go manually, physically, walk in, push the button on, actually the generator will be stored somewhere probably in your garage, you roll this generator, it's like your uh, lawnmower, you know, you're going to roll it all the way to the back where there's an outlet here, grab the cable, plug it from one side into the generator, from the other side into this 
power outlet already installed by the electricians and push the button if it's uh, electric start generator you push the button this generator you're up and running right now we're running then you're going to go down to your basement walk and go to this switch can you guys see this switch this is called mechanical error locking switch mechanical error locking switch work like this if he's on his on generator off utility if you are to flip them they always work together mechanically interlock they will not allow the generator and the utility to be tied together at the same time can i have thumbs up chad mechanically interlock so here's I'm, I'm going right now this is this switch right here okay three pole and you need you to three pole guys to switch the neutral to two hot and a neutral required so now we're on jet we're and we're on the utility here after I start my generator, actually before I start my generator, I have to go, it doesn't really matter because it's isolated. You start your generator, you go down now and you flip it. What do you do when you flip it? You disconnected yourself from the utility and connected yourself to the generator. Now, all, everything connected from this mode is running on generators. That's so you don't backfeed the utility, right? Absolutely. That's required by code. You cannot backfeed into the utility. Unless you have parallel generators, and that's a whole different story. We'll talk about industry on that one. So this device here is the single most important thing. This is a three-pole um, circuit breaker. Um, three, two circuit breakers, three-pole tied together. Three-pole, three-pole, three-pole on every side and tied together. When you flip them, they flip on, one on, one off, the three of them. Can you guys see that? Three-pole. Um, why three-pole? For smaller UL, I think it's somewhere here, it says UL require if you have a 15 kW or less, 15 kW or less, it requires you guys to have, a, it requires to have a separately derived system. Separately derived system, you always, here's what you need to remember about separately derived system, you always switch the neutral. So how are you going to switch the neutral um, when you have a, a 24120? If you have 24120, you're going to flip you, you want to disconnect the hots, and you have to have one to disconnect the neutral. So you need three pole. So this one will look like this. One, two, three, all tied together. And this will be hot one, hot two, neutral. And side by side, right next to them, guys, it will be another one uh, tied together. It will be hot one, hot two, and in neutral. And these two are tied, these two systems are tied together. Can you see that? Tied together in a way where one of them will be on, the other must be off. Mechanically interlocking. Can I have a thumbs up, Chad? We fully understand what mechanically interlocking is. This is one of the cheapest way of bringing power to your building. So this panel is 60 amp panel, 60 amp panel, and you get yourself a power. 60 amp panel, and you get yourself a power. Any question guys about this? That's connected to the main. That's connected the main to the main. Stuff. This is a 40 amp. 40 amp main here's a 40 amp so under normal conditions guys look, look how they do it under normal condition the this circuit breaker will be flipped into the panel so all these loads will be the power will be coming let's see the red here the red is going right here and feeding everything from the utility now that's normally when you lose power you go disconnect this one bring it down now the power when you start your generator and then the power goes all the way up here it doesn't go back because it's flipped here and it goes all the way and feed these loads only can you have a thumbs up, Chad? We fully understand what a critical panel is. A critical panel like this. Now, be very careful when you do a critical panel. They sell them in the market a lot. You need a critical load panel. They give you, when you have a critical load panel, guys, they give you this type of circuit breaker with it because it doesn't meet the code unless you have this. Can you see that? This circuit breaker right here is very important. And it looks like this here. Can you have a thumbs up? Yep, Chad, we fully understand that one. Okay, so that's easy. See that cable, portable cable plug with both sides, start your generator, flip the switch to the generator side, you're up and running with this loop. And I want to remind you, this side is your main panel, so you can see the bonding and the grounding and everything is happening where? Right in this panel, right in this panel. Any questions? So your system here, the portable generator, is grounded where? Where is it grounded? It's grounded directly through the, the system here. Your cable that you're pulling right here, this cable is going to be four conductors. Um, it's going to be what? Two hots, one neutral, and one ground, right? Four conductor cable. Two hots, one neutral, and one ground to ground the system.
Any comments, any questions about this? This tend to be, guys, a uh, lockable type, exactly like these ones, where you can push them in. You lock them, you push them, and you lock them. Lock inside devices instead of the plug-in devices. Any comments, guys, about this um, generator feeding this house? Now, this is, this is not what we do in a commercial building. We'll do it differently in a commercial building. I'll show you in a second. Any comment about this? That's the cheapest way of getting this. Between a generator, I think probably what, uh, two grand for a generator, maybe $500 for this, plus installation. A system like this probably costs you four grand installed, maybe five grand, depending on where you are. Any comments, any questions? What's the advantage? You can roll that boy anywhere else. It's not, it's portable. Okay, now let's go to, so that's your cheapest. Um, the next step, guys, as we, like we said, cord and plug, we have a, um, up in both permanent wiring. So we have cord and plug. So we have a cord and plug and we have permanent wiring. Um, so if you have a permanent wiring, so that, uh, now you see, you see the one, the one that we were just talking, looking at, it's, there's a plug, right? You plug it in. The permanent wiring does not have a plug. So in, in instead of a plug, you have a, a manual start, start for the generator, all of them do, and you have a transfer switch device from normal that transfer you from normal to emergency. Um, and some of them that we talked about the cord here, but, but if they're permanent wires, the wires are going to be completely connected. Okay. So this is, uh, this, this is you guys shows what happened when the power is coming from the generator. Can you guys see that? Now we lost the utility here. The first thing that you do, what do you do? The first thing you walk into your basement here, flip this circuit breaker. Now we open this circuit breaker is open. This is, is closed, right? We come outside, roll the generator from your garage, put it in wherever the outlet is located, plug it from both sides. These are plugged both sides. Start your generator and you're up and running and all your loads, critical loads are on. Now what happened to every load in this panel? What happened to this panel? Sure, everything, every load is done. Good idea to have at least one lighting circuit in your house in different levels. Good idea to have your fridge and freezer and furnace. So the circuit that feed the fridge and the freezer and the furnaces on one, um, on one. Uh, good idea for Brian to have a uh, plasma TV on it too. Or anybody else. <laughs> I don't own a TV. I know, I know, I know. I'm just picking on you, Brian. Okay. Any question guys about this one? This is your plug. This is your plug. Um, now, if you want to go, this is the poor man's work of doing it, believe it or not, Andrew. Now you go to the rich man's doing it. We don't want to go roll that generator from the garage, right? We're just going to have a permanently installed generator in the outside. Cool. And that's what they call it, top of the line for dwelling. And we're talking dwelling. Permanently installed generator outside. Um, so instead of the cord, everything will be wired. So you need uh, outside, you have to have a brand circuits. This in the panel, transfer switch to transfer the power from the generator. And you have your option, auto transfer load when the power is off. You can have an auto transfer, meaning you're in the middle of the night and you lost power. And instead of walking to the generator and push the button, if you have an auto transfer switch, it will sense that the power lost, sense that the power was lost. Auto. And send the signal to the generator, say, wake up, start. So what they do is you generator guys, they have it. They have a, they warm your generator. They have, there's a plug that keeps the generator warm. Yeah, they're a heater. Jacket heaters to keep the oil and everything is running on the generator. Otherwise, your generator will never wake up. Generators, they have a jacket, water heater. Wa uh, they, they, were, they heat the generators. There's a whole lot of mechanisms for heating it, keeping it ready. Get a signal to start from the auto transfer switch up on the loss of power. It fires. Within 10 seconds or so, it flips into the transfer switch and you're up and running in business. Up and running in business. Uh, when you wire this system, we look at it, you have two, you have two uh, conductors for ungrounded and neutral, 24120. Um, the grounding and bonding have to tie, all your conduits have to be bonded to the grounding and bonding in the, in the building, you'll see in a second here. Uh, there's a concept that we call a transfer switch, guys. That transfer switch, either manually or auto, it transfers the power. It transfers the load from one side of the, uh, from the utility into the standby and bring it back. 
Um, the, the most important thing about the auto transfer switch, this is manual transfer switch or auto transfer switch. Either one, it isolates the utility first. Always isolate the utility from the standby system. Why do we do that? No feedback. You're not hitting anybody on the line, right? Uh, sizes that we use for these guys, 40 all the way to 60. When you come with me next quarter, when we start sizing an auto transfer switch for the commercial building, do you guys remember DeWalt that we use here for disconnect switches? We use as a standard the disconnect switches. Just for the calculation, you're very close if you use the disconnect sizes, which is 30, 60, 100, multiple of hundreds. Okay, so we'll, we'll look at the picture, the most important thing. Um, um, so there are two, now there are two systems I want to show you, and I, I, I want to talk about these systems. Anybody know, have you guys heard about separate drive system and non separate drive system? Raise your hand if you heard about separate non separate drive system. You understand the difference? You guys understand what the difference between separate and non separate drive system? One word. If you disconnect the neutral, you're a separate drive system. If you don't disconnect the neutral, you're a non separate drive system. Can I be a separate drive system one day, a non separate drive system the other day? Yes, for a generator. You have, it's a decision that you have to make. What's the difference if you have a non separate drive system? Um, non, like I said, non separate drive system, you generate a neutral and a neutral from the grid are tied together. They're not switched. Uh, separate drive system, you switch the, the generator. So if I have a switch, let's just draw a couple of, here's my load, and um, I'm just draw, uh, here's my, this is my um, utility. This is my gen, um, and this one is coming to my, I'm just gonna do, draw a big thing here. This is my load, okay? Bringing it, this is hot one. Look, I'm gonna draw hot two, just just uh, the same thing. Here's hot two, here's a utility, here's the generator, and here's my flip switch, and this is hot two. And here's my neutral, look at my neutral. Now here's my neutral, um, here's my utility, utility, here's my generator. So if you look at this, can you guys look at this one here? If you, if you, here's my hot one, the red is hot one. Can you guys see, am I switching hot one with the auto transfer switch, yep. Am I switching hot two? Yep, am I switching the neutral? Yep, is this a, a separate drive system? Yes. Does, it, does that make sense? And I'm showing the, all the phases. This is all inside the auto transfer to the manual transfer. We're switching the, the three of them. Then you have a separate drive system. Now, look at this scenario here. What happens if I um, just bond these together? Can you see that? There's no switch here. They're all tied together. Can you guys see that? Everybody can see that? No switch. The three of them are tied together with a wire knot or a, a bolt. What would that make this system? non separately derived system. Can they have a thumbs up? We fully understand, Chad. Awesome. That's what we want you to do about separately, non separate. Do you switch the neutral or you don't? If uh, UL require you guys, if you have a portable generator, 50 kW or less, you have to be separately derived system. So you have to switch the neutral. If it's higher than 50 kW, it's up to you. High than 50 kW is up to you. Okay, um, a couple of things, guys, about generators. We have you have to have a disconnect for the generator. This, there's some exceptions for this disconnect for the generator. Um, so you have to have a, a every generator to, and you have to have a disconnect required for the standby generator to be located remote, and that disconnect can be remotely located from the main panel. You can put the disconnect for the generator somewhere right by the generator. So disconnect to isolate the generator, that's from the code. Uh, grounding, your generator have to be grounded, exactly like any other system. So what we end up doing, guys, the grounding conductor tied all the grounding system for the generator and the utility all together. So grounding it either with a conduit or with a grounding conductor. Um, when we size the generator, and believe me, next quarter, I don't want to do that now. Next quarter, you guys will be sizing the generator for me, and we will be sizing the disconnect and the fuse and all this stuff. But when we size the generator, guys, 
you have to have an overcome friction device for the generator, and you have the gen right in here. Right in between, you have an auto transfer switch, auto transfer switch, and you have uh, from here you have utility. So this all this branch here, um, this is uh, generator auto transfer switch. So we have to, you have to size all these. I, I have to have an overcome friction device right in here, and this is coming into another panel, different panel. So we have to size the overcome friction device for the generator and the conductors and the auto transfer switch. So there's a lot of stuff that we're going to be sizing. And the way they size the conductor, 150% times the full load current of the generator. I'm not going to do calculation for this, guys, because next quarter we're going to be sizing the generator and we will do all this calculation. All this calculation. Okay, when you size the generator itself, when you size the generator, guys, the generators are rated in kilowatts, kilowatts, and there are two ways of sizing the generator. When you size, I'll show you in a second. You size the generator based on two things. For example, Joe, what size generator do I need? Do I need um, a, a, a 50 kW generator or a 100 kW generator? You size them based on what they call it, the running load and the starting capability of the generator. I'll show you an, exa an example. And then you, based on the load and the generator, you size the transfer switches. I have a whole lot of calculation guys coming for you um, when we go to the commercial project. <clears throat> um, okay, so we talked about this article guys about the standby, legally standby, um, um, I mean optional. Most of the generator that you do for dwelling they uh, they go under 702 which is option standby system it's up to you to do them a couple of things guys uh, especially in minnesota and every city guys when you put a generator the first thing you need to do is to especially for commercial buildings <coughs> you're going to check with local sound ordinance in your area generators are loud if it misses off your neighbors um it's not a good day there's a lot of ordinance guys especially for commercial buildings you're going to see they can come the inspector come and actually measure the decibels of the the noise decibel right at the property line and it has to meet certain criteria so especially for commercial building as residential because we don't run them residential unless you have an outage when you have an outage people don't care too much everybody's down so it's kind of an emergency but for uh for utilities then for a commercial building big big deal and we'll leave this topic on to um, to the commercial project, guys. When we go to the commercial, I want to show you a few pictures here. Um, okay, probably this is one of the cheapest way of having uh, a generator. And instead of even having and instead of even having a panel, you just have a generator here, and you plug certain loads. Can you guys see that? I have a sump pump in my house, and it's flooding. And I have a, uh, I just go just directly through the pump. Anybody have seen things like that? So you have a generator, and the generator has plugs in it, right? So you start your generator, and you just go, and your pump has a plug, right? Instead of panel and everything else, you just plug. You have an extension cord that takes the generator power into the plug. So typically, it will be this plug will be sitting right here, right? You plug it in here, and this is coming from. Uh, utility in your basement, right? Now you lost power, your basement is going to flood, you unplug it from here, and where do you go? To extension cord and plug in your generator. Utilities, uh, cities use this guys all the time. City of Bloomington, they have lift stations uh, that in lower area, they pump all the sludge and stuff, take it to the w wastewater treatment plants. So if you lose power, what they do, they drive a generator, they put it right next to the sump pump, um, to the lift station pumps and they plug these pumps to run it. So that's probably one of the cheapest way of doing it. Now remember that <laughs> everything has to be, <laughs> all these have to be GFSM protected based on the code, 15, 20 amps, 30 amps, <coughs> 120, 240. So you have multiple options of having generator, right? And this is just an extension code. You plug from one side 120, from the other side you get 120. If you need 240, you plug 240 here. From the other side, what do you get? Another cord, 240. Can you have thumbs up, Chad? We fully understand that cheap. This is probably the cheapest. The second option, guys, is this one. We talked about this one. So step one is just picking one load at a time. 
Step two, you pick multiple loads. Now you need what? You need a panel, right? So we talked about this one too. Um, here's how the, I don't know if you guys can see, this is with the power coming from a generator. Typically, here's how the power coming from the utility, right? Um, the power will come from the generator. Can you guys see this, how we open this circuit breaker here? And we tie the circuit, uh, we, and we tie the one that goes to the generator. Everybody can see that? Andrew, Kerry, my friend, can I have thumbs up that we fully understand that one? Cool? Okay. So that's your generator, power from this generator. Now, I want to talk about this one, guys. This is the top of the line uh, used for basically drilling. Now, this is permanently installed generator. Can you guys see a permanently installed generator? I need a disconnect. I have, can you guys see the disconnect that you have to provide right next to the generator to disconnect the generator? Then I bring my power um, from here all the way to the auto transfer switch. You size this one based on 1.15 times full load current of the generator. This is my gem. Size this. Then I have an auto transfer, auto transfer switch or manual transfer switch, right? And I transfer it. Now um, I can have a separately drive system or I can have a non-separate drive system. Here's my auto transfer switch. I'm bringing a 60 amp. I still have a critical panel. So not the whole building, just part of the building with an auto transfer switch or a manual transfer switch. <clears throat> Any question guys about this one? This is basically where you have a, a transfer auto or manual transfer switch, fully installed, um, feeding a, a bunch of panels here. If this is um, th if this is a, a, a separately derived system, non-separately derived system or separately derived system, guys, you can see neutral bus isolated from the, the equipment in this panel. The neutral is isolated from the equipment because you can get your ground either from the utility or from the generator, either from the utility or from the generator, depending upon if it's separated drive system. If it's separated drive system, here's what they do. They bring a neutral and they ground the neutral right here. That becomes a separated drive system. And then what do you do here? You isolate the neutral. If it's a non-separated drive system, all what they do is just you have to ground the frame, just the frame, not the neutral. The neutral is not grounded. In this case, my neutral is not grounded. And um, and and uh, so it's non separate drive system. And this is not actually the neutral. This is the control. I want to bring to your attention, guys, the control wire that's coming here. This is for auto transfer switch. You have to have another conduit that bring control wires to the generator. Anybody knows why this control wires? Because the auto transfer switch is going to send the signal to the generator to start, right? Using the battery in the generator. Um, it's going to sense that there is no power. When, when the power is lost here, the first thing happens is send the signal through these lines, telling the generator, wake up, we have an emergency start. When this is start, it flips into the generator side and power everything else here. So you need to have, can you see the two conduits, one for the emergency, and one for the control and one for the, the power. Um, the other thing I want to emphasize too, is if you have a neutral, let me just say if you do it this way, here I'm going to show the neutral. And coming that right here, where's my neutral? Neutral bus and put it right in here. Can you guys see the neutral? Can anybody tell me if this is separate drive system if I do the neutral this way or non separate drive system? I'm not switching the neutral. This is a non separate drive system because I don't switch the neutral. How do I make this one a separate drive system? Switch the neutral. So you're going to have a, basically a, 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 a switch here that switches the neutral to the load. Here's my neutral coming in here. Switch the neutral. So if you switch the neutral here, non separate drive system. Um, if you, if non separate drive system, if you don't switch the neutral, is non separate. If you switch the neutral, separate drive system. If you don't switch the neutral, is non separate drive system. Any comments, guys? Any questions? Okay, so that's basically, this what you're looking at right now, if you understand it fully. This is what we're going to do for the commercial building. This is what we're going to do for the industrial building. Exactly the same application.
This will show us, I don't know if you guys can see the first, see how the power is coming from the utility. Everybody can see the red is coming here. Now we lost power, look what happened. Now we flip, we sense this power flip, and we go into the, to the generator. We go into the generator. Any questions, any comments about this, guys? Any questions, any comments? Okay, let's go into um, sizing the generators. And that will be it. When you size the generators, which you guys are going to have uh, software from your friend Chad, that you're going to size your generator. The first thing you need to do when you size the generator, guys, keep, keep track of two types of loads. The first type is the voltage, the operating. Can you guys see this? It's called the operating. And this one is the starting. So if you have a blender, they're assuming it's going to consume um, 600 volt amp to run it and 700 to, to start it. Can I just get you to understand the difference between the starting load and the running load? The starting load, guys, only for 10 seconds. This here, only for maximum 10 seconds. That's all. For 10 seconds, equipment will take almost six times motor to start them. Remember the starting current on the motor? To, just to put them oomph, give them an oomph to start. When they start a run, it reduces the amount down to what? To this. Let's take an example of, um, uh, what do we have, a, a bigger example, uh, a grill, uh, oven, uh, lights. All these guys are given to you, electrical range, um, electrical drill. So let's use uh, the PTUs, based on the PTUs. Uh, these are air conditioning. Yeah, air conditioning are really cool to use. Look at this 40 PTUs air conditioning, for, uh, 40,000 PTU air conditioning. Can you guys see that? That's as bad as it gets. If, to pick an AC, guys, what happened with the AC? It has a motor in it. To start an AC that has a motor, you need almost six times more power. So look at this. I need to run that boy. I need six, uh, this is six, what, six kVA. But to start that one, how much do I need? 18. So this is like three times. Three times more to start the load than to run it. If you understand this, when we saw the generator for the commercial building and the industrial building that's coming, you have no problem swinging through the whole system. What we do, guys, when we size these generators, these are recommendations for different loads. What we do in real life is we have a software. We have a software that we plug inside, or all these loads will be plugged in the software. So if you have an air conditioning, you pick the air conditioning. Based on the air conditioning size, it will assign two loads for it. The running load or the operating load as well as the starting load. So let me just give you an idea, guys. If your starting load is too high, you might, your generator, if you need a 50 kW generator and your starting load is high, you might have to go to a 100 kW generator because you need to start a lot of things at the same time. So when we go into the generator and you're going to be with me when we do this one, I want to tell you, when you start your load for a commercial building, always, always start them in steps. So uh, we have a 4,000 amp switch gear. We, we first, we start the emergency load, done. Then we start the legally required standby, done. Then the other critical loads, done. And then we start picking them in steps, in steps of 10 to 20 seconds. So take 10 seconds, switch the emergency light. We're done. 10 seconds, switch the other light, the legally required standby systems, done. Another 10 seconds, do something else, in steps. By doing them in steps, guys, you can reduce the amount of, um, you can reduce the size of that generator. Before I leave this, I can't emphasize, when you size a generator, can everybody understand that there are two loads you size a generator based on? One is the running load, and the other one is what? The starting load. Operating load is the running load. The starting load is when you start the system, when you start the system. Okay, so here's, um, that's basically it. In terms of in terms of sizing a generator, we don't size the generator right now, guys. Um, um, like I said, we, we're not going to be sizing the generator by hand. Um, we I don't have part of my teaching this class. I don't have an assignment to size the generator for you guys, just because of the short of time. But uh, next quarter, we you will have a software, and we will be talking about the same thing. You got it now, Kerry, my friend. You're done. You don't get it. You have another two chances of getting it.
Isn't that cool? Chances. All right. Any question, guys? Any question about that? To summarize, when you size a generator, the KW size have to be based on the running load and the starting load. When you have multiple methods for dwelling guys to do, the cheapest way is just a portable generator with a plug and plug load one load at a time. The next step is a plug and you plug a panel, a critical load, that's the next step. The third step is permanently installed, like this one, permanently installed generator with an auto transfer switch that can transfer certain loads. Any comments, any question? Is it Monday or what? Tuesday. Not Monday? Okay. <laughs> All right, so we'll talk more about these guys as we go into them. Okay, that's all we have. We're going to do red lines for uh, starting with Kerry, my friend. Thank you.